الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين أما بعد فعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Dear viewers, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Ahlan wa Sahlan series 1445. Alhamdulillah, you have been enjoying the programs with us throughout past few days and I hope uh, you will enjoy the programs in upcoming days as well. Alhamdulillah, on various days we have different speakers and they speak on different topics. Alhamdulillah, they have educated us a lot. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all the speakers who came and lectured in this beautiful series, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, today we have a personality who needs no introduction, a personality who is welcomed in many places throughout the country and internationally. His eminence, Hafiz Ismail Azarwi Sahab, who is the deputy principal of Darul Uloom Pretoria. Let us welcome his eminence. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How's your health, Azrat? Alhamdulillah, Azrat. How are you doing? Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Inshallah, his eminence will educate us, inshallah, in regards to Islamic history till Karbala, inshallah, from Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salam. Tell the Karbala, inshallah. So his eminence, I would like to ask him to, inshallah, commence the program. Alhamdulillahi wahdah wa salatu wa salamu ala man la nabiyya ba'dah wa ba'd. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It's a tall order. It's going to be a lengthy discussion. Allah. I hope we can finish uh, uh, the the thing, uh, our discussion in the, in the limited time that we have. But I want to start from a very pertinent aspect which Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself mentioned. And he said, Ana ibn Zabi Hatayn. I am the son of two people that have been sacrificed. Zabi Hatayn, two sacrificials that has taken place. And if we have to relate with this, then we have to go back some 4,000 years. And during the time of Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, because the link from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam is he has always referred to Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam as my father Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. And he would often say, Millata abikum Ibrahim. Uh, so, if we take that aspect into consideration, then we will also be able to relate that with the previous month, the month of Zil Hajjah, which was the closing month of the year, then we would look at the Hujjaj, we would look at their visit to the Haramain Sharifain and the particularly in the five days of Hajj, where the rituals of Hajj start from Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. So, Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam undertook this journey and from that which we know today as parts of Egypt, uh, uh, right from there, to the point where he arrives in Makkah al Mukarrama. And a significant aspect plays out here that Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam always made dua in the court of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that, Oh Allah, favor me with a son, favor me with offspring. Rabbi hadli min as salihin. And according to some narrations, he was rewarded his dua when he was about 86 years of age. There are other narrations as well. But uh, this was the ripe old age when Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam experienced the joy of having a son in the name of Ismail alayhi salatu was salam. So, Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam journeys until he comes to that place which was destined for him by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a valley of Makkah al Mukarrama between mountains precisely where stands the holy Kaaba today. And when he came, he spent two to three days there 
And in this two or three days, he put up a small little shack with some grass on it. And that was the shelter that he made for his wife, Sayyidah Hajra, and his son, Nabi Ismail, alayhi salatu wassalam. And on departure, he looked at the two of them. And without saying the, 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 the formal farewells, he mounted his conveyance and then he moved away. According to some historians, say the Hajra traveled along with Nabi Ibrahim wasalam, for up to three miles and a distance of three miles, she kept asking him, what are you doing? Why are you leaving us behind? What is your objective? What are your plans? And now we can understand that when it's an issue between two ladies, she was the second wife and uh, 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 say that Sarah was the first wife. So we can understand from there that there could have been, you know, some sort of, a, uh, uh, you know, uh, issue between the two women. However, I'm not confirming this in any way whatsoever. Neither am I, uh, you know, pointing any fingers. But in a mind of a lady who is the second wife, naturally these kinds of thoughts do begin to play out. Mm -hmm. But for a distance of three miles, and then she looks up to him, and it suddenly dawns upon her that my husband is a Nabi of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And not just a Nabi of Allah, but he is Khalilullah. He is the friend of Allah. Allah refers to him like that. What am I doing? Why these questions? I should not be asking these questions. And then she asks one more final question. Is this the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And when he says, yes, it's the command of Allah, then she says, I am now satisfied. Because if Allah has commanded you to do this, then he will look after us. Irrespective if this is a barren land, irrespective if there's no water, there's no vegetation, there are no people in sight, but I will choose to remain here. And I will remain here and I will be steadfast in my, in my remaining here. It was difficult for one lady, Allah. one infant child, water in a leather pouch that could supply them for just about three days. Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam makes a dua in the court of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he says, Oh Allah, I leave my progeny here and do take care of them. Subhanallah. And she realizes this already. And then he moves off. And she stands there until the dust of the conveyance is even disappeared. And she turns back to the spot where she was. And when there's no more water to be found, then we know the aspects here. And I'm not going to go into too much of details here, but we know what transpired here. Until she gave up absolute hope after a few days. No water in sight, no vegetation, no people around, nowhere to go and ask for. And then she moved herself away from her child that if what has to happen to me, let it happen to me. Or if what has to happen to my child, not in front of my vision. Mm -hmm. I want to be absent with my vision at that point in time, cast and gazed upon him. And then she hears the sound of water. And then when she was running between Safa and Marwa and looking for water, and then when she puts herself at a distance away from Nabi Ismail alayhi salam, suddenly she hears the sound of water. And when she comes, then she finds that by the movement of the heel of Nabi Ismail alayhi salatu wasalam, water began to gush from there. And all she did was take a few stones and create a surrounding around that water until it puddled there and there was a small pool of water. Again here, the important aspect to remember is that we have a Nabi of Allah who is using a portion of his body to contact the earth for what is desired by him and by his mother, and that is water. 
And the gift of water in the form of Zamzam is what you and I still enjoy today. And we use it as a means of Shifa. We use it as a means of cure for our ailments. And it is proven scientifically to be the best of waters on surface earth. Alhamdulillah. So Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam returns to his family 13 years later. And 13 years later when he comes, then he says, as Quran says, قَالَ يَا بُنَيَّ إِنِّي أَرَى فِي الْمَنَامِ أَنِّي أَزْبَحُكَ فَانْزُرْ مَاذَا تَرَى That I saw in a dream. I'm offering you as a sacrifice. I'm going to slaughter you. What do you feel about that? How do you think about that? And Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam asks this question to his son. Now place any father, any, any, any uh, a child relationship, uh, you know, in that context. And you're talking about, people today would say, this is murder. This is atrocious. How can this happen? But a Nabi speaking to a Nabi. Father as Nabi, son as Nabi. And look at the beautiful conversation that they have. And he says, Fanzur what is, what is your input into this matter? And then he says, Qala ya abatifal, ma tu'mar. Satajiduni insha'Allah min as sabirin. Oh my father, ya abadi. Do as you, as you please. As you've been commanded to do. If you've been commanded to slaughter me, to sacrifice me, then do that. And you will find me from those who exercise patience. So, Nabi Ismail says to his father, that you can lay me down, fasten me, but put me face down to the ground, so that, uh, uh, you know, you don't have to look at my face and be troubled with love of a father for his son. So rather not look at my face and you can slaughter me like that. And it goes on and on, you know, the discussion goes on and until we know that, uh, uh, you know, a ram was sacrificed. When Nabi Ismail alayhi salatu wasalam, when, he, when Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam tried and when he gave the motion to the knife and when the knife failed to slaughter and then he actually called out to the knife that why are you betraying me? Mm. I am here to fulfill the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you are betraying me mm. until such time that when he now felt Nabi Ismail alayhi salatu wasalam told him untie me, mm. leave me loose. I don't want a historian tomorrow to write that out of fear or I was bound and under duress I was slaughtered. So let me be a free person and you do what you want to, but you will still find me one that will be exercising patience. So this is one sacrifice. And now we need to link this to another sacrifice and then say how Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam terms the fact, ana ibn zabihatayn. So we come back to that. Jazakumullah khair. Inshallah, we will take a short break. Please stay with us. There is much more informative talk which will take place in upcoming segments. Welcome back. Inshallah, we will continue with the informative Islamic history which our eminence guest of honor is educating us about inshallah so we spoke about this aspect uh, where nabi ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam has now prepared his son and the slaughter is about to take place the knife refused and then he addresses the knife and finally when he finds that there is a movement that has taken place and that a slaughter has actually happened only to realize that when he removed the, the, the cover from his eyes to find that a ram was slaughtered and he saw Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam standing, Nabi Ismail alayhi salatu wasalam looking with full love to his father and that he's been saved by the ram and the glow on his face, the happiness on his face 
Nabi Ismail alayhi salatu wasalam looked at his father in such a manner that the father said, what happened here? Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam says that Allah has accepted your sacrifice from you and Allah has sent the heavenly ram so that it be slaughtered. So again, we now move on from here. And what we need to take cognizance of is that Nabi Ismail alayhi salatu wasalam was entrusted from Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam with the nur of the nubuvvat of Rasulullah sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wasallam. So from Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam to Nabi Ismail alayhi salatu wasalam because he was the one to preserve the nur of Nabi Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wasallam. Until that nur travels from progeny to progeny until it reaches to the house of Hazrat Abdul Muttalib. And from there to the son Hazrat Abdullah. Hazrat Abdul Muttalib made a dua and made a dua to Rabbi Kaaba. That's how the Arabs would do it at that point in time. They would supplicate to the Lord of the Kaaba. So he made a dua and he said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala must bless me with 10 sons. And if I have 10 sons, I will sacrifice one son in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we need not lose the link here. The link is three people in a barren land of Makkah al Mukarramah. They arrive. Father, mother and son, father departs, mother and son remain until 13 years later when the father returns to offer the sacrifice of his son for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So from this progeny, Nabi Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam's arrival, physical arrival in this world takes place. Now let's come back to this aspect in terms of the dua of 10 sons and one that will be sacrificed. So, when he finally had 10 sons, and he called them on one occasion and said to them, that this is what I, I had made an intention, and now that I am blessed with 10 sons, one of you need to be sacrificed. So, which of you voluntarily wants to be sacrificed? And all 10 of them bowed their head down. And this is adab and respect for parents, mm. where they never opposed parents. Even in a culture back then, which was a culture that was very different. People were uh, 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 very different in their ways, in their thinking, in their thought pattern, etc. But still, when we understand here that where is the ultimate link going to, and the ultimate link being Rasulullah sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam, Obviously, there had to be the aspect of Adab here. Mm. And because of that, all ten sons, they bowed their, hands, their heads down and they, in anticipation that the father will do the selection. Mm. So, when they could not come to any real conclusion about that, then they decided to have some kind of, uh, uh, you know, other input, external input into the matter. And they went to Hurrafa, who was the fortune teller at that point in time, and she suggested that what is the digit of murder, what is the blood money that needs to be paid? So they said 10 camels. So she said 10 sons, 10 camels, that means 100 camels. Mm. So slaughter 100 camels. So Hazrat Abdul Muttalib slaughtered a hundred camels. Then he knew that this is not fulfilling, it's not giving him the satisfaction that, that want that he wants to feel within himself. He's not getting that. And so he sacrificed another hundred camels until it came to the point where they had to now draw lots. So of the ten sons, the names were placed and they were going to draw lots. And two times the name of Hazrat Abdullah came out. Hazrat Abdullah at that point in time was the custodian 
of the nur of nubuwwat of Rasulullah sallallahu wa ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. So, what actually was happening, that the angels were in awe, malaika were looking at what's going to happen on surface earth, and if this becomes a tradition, what then? Two times when they drew lots, the name of Hazrat Abdullah came in, and then it was suggested, give the digit, and that was to give the 100 camels, 100 camels. And then he was still not satisfied. And finally, for the third time, when they drew lots, then at that point in time, it was stated that the 100 camels were then accepted. Sayyidina Abdullah was then uh, 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 freed from this aspect. And then we take into consideration here that the sacrifice that Hazrat Abdullah wanted to do also of a son, the sacrifice Nabi Ibrahim wasalam, was commanded to do of the son. And that is why Rasulullah sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam said, Ana ibn Zabihatayn. Mm. So after this, Hazrat Abdullah enters into matrimony with Hazrat Amina radiallahu ta'ala anha. And after a few months, Hazrat Abdullah leaves for a trade mission to Syria and en route on his return at Madinatul Munawwara, he passes on from this dunya. Sayyidah Amina then decides that she wants to visit her husband's grave, which, is, which was very normal in their, in their culture and in their, in, their, in their way of life, their pattern of life. And she wanted to go. And finally, when she did travel, it was much later. According to some historians, it was when Rasulullah sallallahu ta'ala was six years of age. Uh, among the more accurate narrations are that he was five years and eight months of age. And when she arrived in Madinatul Munawwara, to go to the graveside of her husband, a Jewish rabbi saw Rasulullah sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa in his childhood. And when he saw Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in his childhood, he spontaneously made an announcement that the final prophet that we have been waiting for has arrived. Subhanallah, subhanallah. So people began to flock. Sayyidina Amina was now overwhelmed by the situation and she felt that it was now absolutely necessary for her to protect her child and to give the child all due protection at that point in time. And so she wanted to go away from there. And finally she decided to move away and return to Makkah al Mukarrama. Whilst on this journey, then about approximately 150 kilometers from Madinatul Munawwara, there is a place called Abwa, not far from Mastura. Uh, Mastura also eventually became a place where Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself would stop there. And because it's not very far from the ocean, uh, traditionally Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would have fish at that particular stop. So, she when she was ill, and then she made dua for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She told her uh, Umm Ayman to say that this fever that I have, I'm not going to be able to survive this bout of fever. And I'm requesting you to take my son to the leader of Quraysh and hand him over for, you know, upbringing because I will not be able to survive this this uh, uh, bout of fever. Now at five years and eight months the mother is comforting the son and she's telling him that I see greatness in you and because of you my name will be alive in the dunya. I will not be here but my name will be everlasting and I'm proud of the fact that my name will be everlasting because Allah has chosen me 
to give birth to a person like you and that you are indeed very, very special. So she recognizes the qualities of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and she then obviously departs from this mundane dunya and the leader of Quraysh at that point in time, Abdul Muttalib, then becomes the custodian and the guardian of Rasulullah Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam. And it was, from here we can understand, it was not too long and then Rasulullah sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam at eight years of age also loses his grandfather. And now we need to move on closer towards coming to the aspects moving towards Karbala inshallah when we come back from the break. Inshallah. Jazakumullah khair. Inshallah stay with us and enjoy the third and fourth segment inshallah. Welcome back, inshallah, we'll continue to hear from His Eminence. Jazakallah. Uh, Hazrat Abdul Muttalib had his own special designated place in the Haram, in the Kaaba. Subhanallah. So that was his pedestal, that was his masnad. So nobody dared to sit on that. That was his place, designated, assigned, and you know, that's where he used to be. And it was not even two years, just over two years, and uh, he too departed from this dunya. And because of his stature in the community, the entire marketplace on that particular day was a shutdown. Oh. In respect of the leader, uh, you know, of, of, of uh, Makkah at that point in time. And there was one eight-year-old boy that was crying out Allah. and often and people didn't bother much mm. but he felt the pain and from there once the, the, the funeral processions and the burial, you know, everything was over the custodianship and guardianship moved on to Hazrat Abu Talib. Hazrat Abu Talib nurtured the Holy Prophet Sallallahu and brought him up. At 40 years of age, Rasul Sallallahu Ta'ala then made his announcement of prophethood. And now we know this is, you know, where Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi said to the people of Makkah that, uh, Ya Ayyuh Nas, you know, Qulu La Ilaha Illallah Tuflihu say, Proclaim, you know, recite the kalima accept the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and take your shahada and there were those that were for him and those that were against him those that were for him were very little in number and the rest were all against him and we we do un understand that from here there was lots of difficulties it became trial upon trial tribulation upon tribulation as that Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu laid on burning coal uh, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had thorns laid in his pathway. Offal would be placed on his back Mubarak when he would be, uh, you know, going into sajda. And, uh, you know, Hazrat Zunaira was choked with cloth. Mm -hmm. And Hazrat Sumayya, the first martyr in Islam, Allah. a lady, mm -hmm. a woman. And, uh, you know, Hazrat Yasir was also, you know, martyred at this point in time. Uh, Hazrat Yasser was the father of Hazrat Ammar, Hazrat Ammar bin Yasser, known Sahabi of Rasul Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi One family, you can understand three people mm. and a lady to give her life for the sake of Islam, for the sake of Rasulullah Sallallahu mm. Alaihi Wasallam. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam then told uh, 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 Hazrat Ammar bin Yasser, he said to him, O oh, Ali Yasser, if you exercise patience, make sabr. I guarantee Jannah for you. Subhanallah. So, Hazrat Abu Talib's demise takes place. And uh, Sayyidah Khadija Tul Kubra radiallahu ta'ala anha was the one that would listen very affectionately to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. She would give not only a lending ear to Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam, but she would listen attentively and she would 
she would side with Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And the Amul Huzn comes in place here. Um, Sayyidah Khadija al-Kubra radiallahu ta'ala anha, she also passes on. Rasulullah sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wasallam then goes on to Taif. And he says that the people of Makkah don't want to accept the message from me. And then he moves on to Taif. And we can understand the difficulty of this. On an occasion, Sayyidah Aisha Siddiqa radiallahu ta'ala anha asked Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam, did you have any day that was more difficult for you than the day of Badr or the day of Uhud? And then she says, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, I cannot forget the day in Taif Allah. as to what your family did unto me. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa then explained that as he was walking, as he invited uh, the people, particularly the leaders in Taif and uh, the one leader, Abu Yalil bin Amr, Habib bin Amr and Mas'ud bin Amr, were the three people in particular that Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went and gave the da'wah to them and invited them to Islam. And they not only refused, but they set out the ruffians and hooligans that lined the streets of Taif and they were commanded to throw stones at the feet Mubarak of Rasul wow. sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. Sayyidah Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha cried on the return of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because the feet Mubarak of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was clogged in his sandals Mubarak uh, because of the blood that was beginning to congeal upon the feet of Rasul sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. So from here the difficult moments began to sort of increase mm -hmm. and the increasement of this was to such an extent that Sahaba were being uh, uh, you know, traumatized, they, they were being, uh, 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 you know, harassed, they were being uh, burned, they were being tortured, you know, every kind of torture was, you know, and the kuffar, uh, the non-believers would get joy out of all of this. Mm -hmm. And it would trouble Rasulullah sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam until the migration takes place. And when the migration to Madinatul Munawwara takes place, then we find even here, they did not leave Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They got through to people in Medina that were residents of Medina and they would taunt Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When he would come out into the streets, they would use languages against Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam until the point that the battle of Badr takes place. And then not only the battle of Badr, in the battle of Badr, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam makes dua and he says, Oh Allah, 313 is what I have and 313 is what I have brought to you. And if we don't survive here and the 313 that I have brought before you on this battlefield here, if they are lost, then we are not going to be having anybody until the day of Qiyamah, there will be no one to take your name, Ya Allah. Mm -hmm. So for the sake of deen, for the sake of the preservation of the deen, we need victory here. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them victory. وَلَقَدْ نَصَرَكُمُ اللَّهُ بِبَدْرٍ وَأَنْتُمْ أَزِلَّهِ فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that they came بِسَلَاسَةِ آلَافٍ مِنَ الْمَلَائِكَةِ the 3,000 malaika. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said 5,000 will come. Bikhamsati alafim from Quran. Bikhamsati alafim min al malaika. They descended on the plains of Badr and they supported Sahaba Ikram Ridwanullah Ali Majma'in. But take that into consideration when we look at when we look at the battle of Uhud. When we look at the battle of Uhud, Sayyidina Amir Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu, how he was martyred. Allah. Hazrat Mus'ab bin Umair radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Hazrat Mus'ab bin Umair radiallahu ta'ala anhu was a young man, uh, uh, the son of a, a wealthy lady of Makkah. They say that a type of attire he wore, the dress that he wore, and the perfume that he wore, when he walked past one street, one alley, people would say that Mus'ab bin Umair walked past from here. And when he embraced Islam, the mother took everything from him, even the clothes that were on his body. Mm -hmm. 
and, and the plains of Uhud, the battle of Uhud, when Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa looked at Mus'ab bin Umair in, you know, in, in, in tattered, tattered attire, mm -hmm. then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam teared that this was this Mus'ab bin Umair, that people would come out to look at the type of clothes he wore, and here he is martyred on the battlefield, mm -hmm. and we don't have even a coffin to provide for him. Mm -hmm. The aunt of the Prophet ﷺ came with two pieces of cloth. Sayyidah Safiya, she came with two pieces of cloth for kafan. And uh, first Rasul ﷺ gave to Hazrat Mus'ab bin Umair and then to Sayyidina Amir Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And then when they would cover the head, the feet would be exposed. Allah. When they cover the feet, the head would be exposed. Rasulullah ﷺ teared at that point in time. And he said that cover the head, take grass and cover the feet of my uncle with that grass and we will lay him in his cupboard. So we can understand the difficult times that they had. And from here, we go on to the aspects where Rasulullah sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam <clears throat> would look at the Sahaba, he would look at the companions and they would, they would think you know, the Ashabu Sufa came into existence. Uh, they would sometimes fasten stones, you know, on their bellies. Uh, they would come to Rasulullah and say, we didn't have anything to eat. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa would tell them, you got one stone fastened. And then he would expose his belly to say, look at me, I have two stones fastened. No. So the, it was very difficult times. And when these difficult moments began to come into ease and better moments, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, would share these moments of happiness and joy and comfort with Sahaba Kiram Ridwanullah Ta'ala Alim Ajma'een. And this would go on and on until such time that Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on one occasion looks at the Sahaba and the Sufuf are ready for Salah and they are ready to perform their Salah behind Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then he looks at them and he looks up to the skies and the heavens and then he smiles and he says by Allah if I would be leading you in Salah and my mother would call me Ibni Muhammad if she was here and she would witness the achievements mm. that we have made in Islam she would be happy and if she would call me even if I was in leading you in Salah I would return I would go to her and answer her first Again, the lesson of love, the lesson of adab, the lesson of muhabba has been given by Rasulullah sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. Even under difficult circumstances, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam really promoted this. Then we go on to another difficult time in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that he's got Sayyidina Imam Hussein radiallahu ta'ala anhu as his grandson in his lap, in his lap Mubarak. And on the one side, Sayyidina Ibrahim, his son, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's son and grandson. And an angel comes in and the angel says, Ya Rasulullah, if Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala commands for you to choose between two, what would your choice be? Rasulullah sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam immediately thinks about his beloved daughter Sayyidah Fatima al Zahra radiallahu ta'ala anha, the leader of the women of Jannah. He thinks about her and he looks at his son and his grandson and he says to the angel that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me the choice, then I would give up my son in favor of my grandson. And again, such a difficult moment, so difficult that a few days, hence that, Sayyidina Ibrahim radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the son of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, departs from this mundane world. Sahaba ikram see Rasulullah sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam sitting beside the mayyad of his son and tears streaming down the eyes. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam looked at them and said, the questions you have in your mind, 
The tears that roll from my eyes demonstrate my love for my child. This is my love. I have no control over this because I love my son. Allah has placed that love between parent, parents and their offspring. But what is prohibited? Now look, even at time of grief, Rasulullah sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wasallam gives a lesson and he says that in time of grief, those people who will pull their hair, who will beat their chests and who will be wailing unnecessarily are people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala disapprove of their actions. So again here, we look at the aspect related to Rasulullah sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam's even here, as Ibrahim radiallahu ta'ala anhu departs from the world. So we look again here, the son of Rasulullah sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam as Ibrahim and Nabi Ibrahim alayhi wa salatu wa salam as Khalilullah. Again, we can see the sacrifice that is being made here. Ibrahim alayhi wa salatu wa salam made the sacrifice of Nabi Ismail alayhi wa salatu wa salam. Rasulullah sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam then chooses Sayyidina Imam Hussein radiallahu ta'ala anhu over Hazrat Ibrahim radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So inshallah we go on a little further from here. I can see uh, Hazrat Maulana is indicating towards the break. So let's have the break inshallah. And then we'll be back with you shortly. Inshallah, let's have the break and we will continue after the break. Welcome back to the final and fourth segment of today's program. Inshallah, we'll continue. Let's ask His Eminence what happens when Nabi Ali Salatu Salam chose Imam Hussein radiallahu ta'ala anhu over his son Hazrat Ibrahim radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Jazakallah, uh, Mawlana. Obviously, we take into account here that this, they were at infancy. Jeez. And in infancy, Sayyidina Imam Hussein radiallahu ta'ala anhu totally oblivious of what is happening and that is what is masumiyat that is what is innocence and in the innocence of a little infant child that is cradled in the in, in your arms or in your lap uh, what can actually be related but like i mentioned that uh, a few days later it was time for the you know uh, burial for Sayyidina uh, Ibrahim radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the son of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And you know things went on from there, uh, uh, life continued and uh, to the point where one day Hazrat Huzaifa radiallahu ta'ala anhu was busy in his fields and uh, the mother called him and said, Oh, Huzaifa, where have you been to Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Have you been recently? Have you met the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? And he says, uh, No, it's been a while. I haven't gone. Now, they were on the outskirts of Medina Tul Munawwara. They were basically, uh, you, know, you know, tending to their own lands, cultivating their little crops, living out of that. So coming to Medina meant coming to the marketplace, etc. So when there was a need to come there, that's when they would come. And then he drops everything and he says, the mother says to him, go to Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, give him my salams and tell him to make dua for you and to make dua for me as well. So he leaves, he comes and he reads his salah behind Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it is Asr Salah. He reads salah behind Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and uh, he cannot bolster enough courage to tell Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam why is he there. And time goes on until it is the time for Salatul Maghrib. And then he reads Salatul Maghrib behind Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam until Isha comes in. So Isha Namaz comes in, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam leads the entire Jamaat of Sahaba in Salah. And then Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam leaves the Musalla, leaves the Masjid and goes out. When he goes out, Hazrat Huzaifa is now following Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because he he's here for a purpose. He needs to convey the salams of his mother to Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the request of dua. So as he's trailing behind Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Who is that behind me? Huzaifa, is it you? 
And he says, yes, Ya Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it's me. And then Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says to him, just now I had a visit from Jibreel Alayhi Musalatu Wasalam. And he said to me that uh, Al Hassan Wal Hussein Sayyida Shababi Ahlil Jannah. That Ibn Sayyidina Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein will be the leaders of the youth in Jannah. Hazrat Huzaifa was the first person to hear this hadith from Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And look at the beautiful circumstances. Then Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told him that uh, I have made dua for you and for your mother. Subhanallah. Without him even telling because now he was awestruck because Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, asked him, Huzaifa, is that you? Now remember Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also said to Sahaba Ikram on different occasions that straighten your safs because Allah has granted me the power just as I'm able to see ahead of me, I'm able to see behind me as well. So if your safs are not straight, I will see that they are not straight. So this was the power of prophethood of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Rasulullah sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam then gave a, a, a little a tree, a branch of a tree, a stick, and he held it in his hand, and uh, this, the, the, the stick was illuminated. And he then gave it to Hazrat Huzaifa and said, in the darkness of the night, this will aid you, it will give you light, and you will get back to your house. <laughs> and I mean, these are the miracles of Rasulullah sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. So, from here, we can understand that Sahaba Ikram Ridwanullah Ta'ala Alim Ajma'in would come to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at different times. And they are in being informed that to take that from Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam which Rasulullah gives unto them and to abstain from that which Rasulullah prohibits from. So the verse of the Quran is that if you came to the door of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with any matter, then don't raise your voices. لا ترفعوا أسواتكم فوق صوت النبي Don't raise your voices above the voice of, of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Sahaba Ikram Ridwanullah alayhi wa sallam would come and they would tap the door of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with the forefinger. They would just tap the door like this. And when they would tap the door of, the, of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, can you imagine the hearing power of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that with a simple tap of a finger, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa would hear that and he would come. And on one such occasion when he came out in the night and he was clad with his beautiful sheet Mubarak, the chadar Mubarak that he used to have. So when the Sahaba, Sahabi saw this and they saw movement under the chadar. So the Sahabi was saying, Ya Rasulullah, what is moving under your uh, this thing? So Rasulullah removed the chadar and showed them that on the one side is Sayyidina Imam Hassan and on the other side is Sayyidina Imam Hussein radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So the love that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam displayed for uh, Sayyidina Imam Hassan and Sayyidina Imam Hussein radiallahu ta'ala anhuma was to such an extent that uh, uh, Sahaba actually witnessed this. Mm. One Sahabi came to Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he witnessed Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam kissing one of the Hassanain, uh, you know, on the forehead. And he looked at Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and said, Ya Rasulullah, do you love this child of yours? And Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, yes, I do. He says, I have not kissed any of my children until Allah. today. Mm. Rasulullah sallallahu told him that if your heart, if your heart is as hard as a rock, there is nothing I can do about it. Mm. May Allah soften your heart so you can have love for your children in your heart as well. So Sayyidina Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein radiallahu ta'ala anhuma and their attachment with Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam. There are many occasions that Imam Hussein was on the shoulders Mubarak of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And Sahaba Ikram, Jalilul Qadr Sahaba Ikram would say, look at the ride. Subhanallah. And some would say, no, look at the rider that Imam Hussein is riding on Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So he said, the rider 
has got such a ride. So what is the position of Sayyidina Imam Hussain radiallahu ta'ala anhu? So from here, we are able to understand that Rasulullah sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wasallam gave tremendous amount of love, attention and affection to Hasnain Karimain. And he, he, he truly loved them uh, uh, from, from the time of birth. <clears throat> so, if we look at the physical departure of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Sayyidina Abu Bakr as Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu then ascends to Khilafat and his reign of Khilafat is two and a half years and Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu his period of Khilafat was for a period of ten years Sayyidina Usman al-Ghani radiallahu ta'ala anhu whose Khilafat lasted for 12 years, and Sayyidina Ali Karram Allahu Ta'ala Wajahul Kareem for five years, which gives us a total of 29 and a half years. But Rasulullah Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam said, Al Khilafatu Ba'di Thalathuna Sana. Khilafat after me will be for a period of 30 years. So the last six months of Khilafat as prophesied by Rasulullah sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wasallam fell in the favor of Sayyidina Imam Hassan radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And then we can see the prophecy of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam when he says that this son of mine will be the one that will mend two factions and will bring two factions close together. So Sayyidina Imam Hassan radiallahu ta'ala anhu stepped down from the reign of Khilafat after a period of six months and Sayyidina Amir Muawiyah radiallahu ta'ala anhu then ascended to Khilafat but actually Mulukiyat then started because Khilafat ended with Sayyidina Imam Hassan radiallahu ta'ala anhu as the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned the aspect of Khilafat. What transpires here after that is that in the year 59 Hijrah, Sayyidina Imam Hussein radiallahu ta'ala anhu is summoned by the governor of Madinatul Munawwara by the command of Yazid who had by then ascended to the throne and we can find the various aspects that unfold. Sayyidina Imam Hussein radiallahu ta'ala anhu was called in the darkness of the night by, by the governor of Medina, and when he returns to his house, he tells his family that our time in Medina Tul Munawwara has now come to the end, and we will have to leave Medina. And the entire family was crying and mm -hmm. tearing, and under such circumstances, they had to leave Medina Tul Munawwara, mm -hmm. or else Sayyidina Imam Hussein radiallahu ta'ala anhu would have to take the oath of allegiance on the hands of the governor of Medina on behalf of, uh, uh, for, for and on behalf of Yazid. And when he gets to Makkah al Mukarrama, then again, Sahaba Ikram, they have this uh, uh, discussion and, uh, you know, they have, you know, the approach to Sayyidina Imam Hussein that don't go. Hazrat Abdullah ibn Zubair radiallahu ta'ala anhu says, don't leave, don't go. Let's, we know the people of Kufa. And let's get certain things, you know, conclusively arranged before you leave. It's the time of Hajj and you are going. And he says that I've been for many trips of Hajj. And I've come here and I've related with Hajj. I, I'm able to relate with Hajj. You will make Tawaf and I will be making Tawaf somewhere else. And on some other planes, perhaps making Tawaf of some tents. You will be drinking Zamzam and we will not be having water. No. And you will be making sai, and I will be walking to and fro the battlefield, bringing bodies back. And I will be going on a different kind of hajj, mm. and you will be doing a different kind of hajj. And that is why we are able to culminate this discussion, because there will be others that will be elaborating on this. But Shah has to Hussein, mm. Bad Shah has to Hussein, Di has to Hussein, Di Pana has to Hussein. Sardad Nadad, Dast Dardaste Yazid, 
Hakka ke binai la ila hasta Hussein. So the Lord, the King is, the King is Hussein. And yes, he is the King. And Deen is from Hussein. And the Pana of Deen is also with those that are with Hussein. And not have given the head, but Sardad Nadad Dast Dardast Yazid. They've given their heads in lieu and in favor of not giving their hands on the hands of an adulterer and a one who is an habitual drunkard, etc. But the reality is that La ilaha is the foundation for what Sayyidina Imam Hussein radiallahu ta'ala anhu stood. May we be able to take lessons from the event of Karbala yeah. and may we be able to take issues out of this for the benefit of our lives and so that we can live our lives in accordance with the teachings of the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. Jazakumullahu khair hafiz sahab for such an inspiring talk. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you. Dear viewers, inshallah, we will take your ijazat and see you tomorrow inshallah with different guests and we will inshallah be talking about Karbala. So please join us. See you inshallah in tomorrow's episode.